Uh, not all the film clips we show are uh, funny, uh, but we'll have something that is funny the next time around. Um, <clears throat> good morning, my name is Bruce McDonald, um, and I thought that clip might make a relevant introduction to our first speaker. Um, last week we had two great presentations and, and by two very astute observers of the facts, realities, and, uh, and trends. Uh, and at least for me, it was an opportunity to significantly alter my original preconceptions. Uh, the current members of Congress, and particularly the House, individually and, and uh, generally as a group, in my view, richly deserve their lowest ever ratings. This group, those guys up there, um, this group uh, has abandoned the voters who voted them in. They've walked away from the problems that they were sent to Washington to solve, uh, and they've sent a, song, a strong signal to the rest of the world that elected officials in America cannot overcome their basic differences or come together at a time of extreme ultimate need. Why? Because party discipline and total unwillingness to even discuss with the other party are apparently stronger and a higher priority than addressing America's major problems. And I want to be clear that the blame for this goes equally to both parties. <clears throat> That was my personal view and remains my view of, of Congress uh, and the two parties today. However, our last two speakers were, quite, were both uh, eloquent and convincing in their primary observation. While the party leaders and elected politicians emphasize their strict party rigidity, it is the nation as a whole, the electorate, you and me, that so are so widely polarized, we simply cannot agree on a string of issues that the other party feels are critical, nor convince them of our belief they must be addressed along with their own. We'll come back to that issue uh, uh, next week, uh, but for today, we have uh, two very impressive speakers with uh, deep experience in their uh, fields uh, and strong views about how polarization uh, has impacted America's educational pro programs and how polarization and the media have interrelated with one another. Uh, I, heard, I heard in the lobby just coming in uh, uh, somebody had said uh, there, there was some question by people he talked to, uh, why are we doing these two subjects of media and, and, uh, and education? Uh, and I guess the answer is uh, we've been talking up until now the sources of polarization, what, where it comes from and, and what it is and how to identify it. Uh, I think this morning we're going to get a little more into how that polarization has impacted the whole educational system and how that polarization and the media have worked hand in hand, uh, one amplifying the other, uh, and, and it's really a question of who starts it. Uh, anyway, uh, whether a candidate or a voter, uh, Republican or Democrat, uh, all politicians seem to agree education is a critical issue about which they all care passionately, at least in their speeches. There's a Democratic plan, there's a Republican no child left behind plan, then a Democratic race to the top plan, and yet the U.S. seems to continue sinking in the international rankings, as you've just seen. 
clearly we cannot burden our next speaker to come up with a silver bullet plan, but perhaps we can uh, ask him to help us to understand the conundrum and what are the other issues we frankly don't understand along with whether polarization has or has not played a role. Mr. Marrow certainly has the necessary experience and the credentials from years as education correspondent with PBS and a score of others. So please welcome John Marrow. And no biography. I couldn't remember. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Bruce. And I want to thank Linda and our, our hosts. That uh, we had a lovely dinner last night uh, with uh, Patsy and John Matthews. And I had a lovely dinner the night before with a classmate, Bob Bish, and his wife Beth. I think are here as well. It's a, uh, it's a. I, I went to this college um, a long, long time ago, and so it's a, uh, it's really a kick to be back in Hanover. Um, it's, a, it's a thrill uh, to look out. It's actually kind of a relief to look out and see people out there. Uh, I, I, I flash back to the first speech uh, I ever gave, which was which actually was 40 years ago. Uh, and I was a graduate student at, at, uh, at Harvard, and I had two little kids and I was on a fellowship and a, a PTA uh, somewhere west of Cambridge, I don't remember the town, offered me $50 um, to, to give a speech on something that I thought was important. And so I eagerly accepted. And I was, you know, something like the role of the lunchroom in the third grade curriculum or something like that. that uh, but <laughs> something, a, a real crowd pleaser. and. Uh, <laughs> But I prepared a slideshow, you know, and uh, the speech was supposed to start at 7 o'clock, but I was really excited. And so I got out there about, oh, I don't know, 6.15. And there was a, you know, a sign there, but there was no one there. Uh, and at 6.30, there was still no one there. At 6.45, there was still no one there. Now, it wasn't a big hall like this, but there was room for, you know, 100 people. And there was no one there. So I, I was beginning to get a little nervous, and finally at about maybe three minutes of seven, one person <laughs> walks in. This is a true story. They, um, and I thought to myself, well, you know, what's the, what's the right thing to do here? You got one person, do you give the speech? Do you have a conversation? <laughs> Go out for a drink? That, um, but, you know, I remember Joe DiMaggio, but you know, you don't know who, who's gonna be there, maybe the only time they'll ever get to see you play. So I decided I would give the speech. Well, it was a little awkward because I had to ask him to operate the... Uh, and, but he was very gracious, and he, he operated the slide projector, did it well, and I gave my talk, and, uh, and I was packing up to leave, and I thanked him, and I was packing up to leave, and he said, hey, 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 wait a minute, fair's fair, I'm, I'm the second speaker. And, and so, and so, so it's a, it is a relief to see some people here. Now, I have to say, in a, in a fit of uh, what we wasps call chutzpah, I, I, uh, I had taken a speech course the previous summer. And one of the things that the instructor said was, during a speech, make eye contact. Well, professor would have been very proud of me then. <laughs> but, um, but in any case, so it's a relief to see you here. Um, now, but I have to say, I am, while I'm glad to see you here, I am not sanguine that you are going to listen to what I have to say. And I actually have some scientific evidence 
indicating that most of you are not going to listen. Um, <laughs> there was a study back in, I think it was 87, 88, where they attached electrodes to, anybody remember any scientists here who remember that study? I see a couple of people nodding their heads. Well, they, they measured the brainwave activity to determine what people do during presentations like this. And it's actually, it's actually a little depressing um, <laughs> because it turns out that only 8% of you are actually going to pay attention to what I say, 8%. Now, you probably know who you are, and I, and I will make eye contact with you. <laughs> um, it's, and 11% spend about half of their time listening, and the other half, they kind of think, you know, I wonder if, will the roof make it through the winter? Do we need a new dryer? You know, stuff like that. But it turns out that the the overwhelming majority of people, 81%, 81% spend speeches like this indulging in erotic fantasy. <laughs> now, now, you know, we're all getting older and maybe the number's higher, I don't know. <laughs> but, I, but, you know, Bruce said this is a polarized world and maybe erotic fantasy is the way out of this problem. <laughs> So I'm offering this speech as your opportunity. Um, now, I do, I do, however, have a couple of important points. And so I, every once in a while, so I'm gonna ask, you know, sort of interrupt your reverie just so I can make a couple of points. But otherwise you're on your own, okay? <laughs> and I'll let you know when I finish. But, uh, now about the finish of this speech. I'm not quite sure how it ends. I was practicing last night after I went to bed and I fell asleep. So <laughs> that doesn't bode well <laughs> for, for your time this morning and it probably can get, well, Clark will be worth it you can, or you can get refunds, but in any case. Um, now, I, I, I saw the numbers uh, that flashed through um, about American public education. Um, they're not good. That, they, it's, it's a test called PISA, a program, uh, International Student Assessment, administered by OECD. It's quite reliable. It's 15-year-old kids. Um, in reading, and there's 65 countries that participate. In reading, the average of 65 countries is 493. We are currently tied for 15th with a score of 500, so we're slightly above average, and we're 15th out of 65. Yeah, well, in math, the international average is 496. Here we are tied for 31st, tied with Ireland and Portugal, and our score is 487, so we are below the international average. And then the third category is science. Um, the 65 nation average is 501. We are 23rd with a score of 502. So we are essentially an average country. You know, we're no more, we're number one. We're in the middle, we're in the middle. You know, it's not, it doesn't resonate. That, uh, um, but those, those numbers are, are a symptom. So th the question is what, what is the problem? And I would actually, if you don't mind, ask for a show of hands on what you think the, the, the most significant, and all of these that kind of overlap, but I'm going to ask you to I'm going to give you a forced choice and ask you to, to give me a, a hand, raise your hand for the one that you think is the most serious issue facing our public schools. And I'm going to give you eight choices. I'll read all of them and then I'll come back and ask you to vote. Okay. So here are the eight choices. The eight causes of this international decline, possible causes. Is it teacher unions and bad teachers? Is it not enough money? Is it parents, the home, lack of discipline? Is it too much testing? Is it low expectations, you know, we get what we expect? Is it government interference? Is it ineffective leadership? And finally, is it poverty and its attendant consequences, uh, issues like healthcare and housing and nutrition? So those are the eight. 
I'll just go back. If you, if, if when I say the one you think, want me to say them again? You're good? Okay. Um, when I say the one that you think is the most important, just put your hand up, okay? Um, and you have to vote. There's none of this. Um, is it teacher unions and bad teachers that's the fundamental cause of our problem? Okay. Is it that we do not spend enough money? One hand, two hands have gone up, okay. Is it parents? The home, lack of discipline at home, okay, where that's in first place. Um, is it too much time devoted to testing as opposed to teaching and learning? We get, okay. Is it low expectations? Do we simply not expect enough of our young people? That's in second place. Um, is it government interference? Okay, we got one guy. We got two guys. Two. All right. That, uh, is it ineffective leadership? Okay. Um, and finally, is it poverty? Okay. So we have, I would say that the, the, the three that strike you as being the, um, the key issues, well, the two that seem to be the top were poverty and the home and the lack of discipline and the parents with teachers and unions coming in a close, a tie for first with a close second. So maybe at the end I should ask you and see if any of you have changed your mind. But So I've been, I've been asked to... I'm sorry? I still can't hear you. Low expectations. Oh, did, did I not ask for a vote on low expectations? Is it low? It was, it was first? Third. Third. Oh, okay. Well, so let's see. All right. We have, we have an election. We're polarized about the election results. Yeah, what are, what are you going to do? <laughs> so uh, so I, I, I haven't asked to talk about polarization in education. Uh, you know, how is education polarized? So let me count the ways. Um, I, if I have time, I will try to talk about seven ways of thinking about polarization. We're, we're polarized, in, in my view, about this question of accountability. Do we, do we trust teachers or do we in, not trust them and insist on verification? Um, a friend of mine this spring told me that her son who was in third grade, couldn't sleep. I said, how come? He, he, she said, he doesn't want to go to school. I said, is he being abused or something? Because you need to report that. She said, no. The teacher said to the whole class, and to him, I said, you have to do well on this test or I, I'll lose my job. And so he is, you know, scared sleepless, if you will. Um, I mean, think about that. It's so incredibly unethical for a teacher to say that, but what, what were the pressures on that teacher that led her to say that to a third grader? Um, that, and it's this thing about accountability. So the question is, you know, how or can we hold teachers accountable? How do we hold them accountable? And I mean, I'd like to, I, I'm going to show a couple of clips. Um, which will be much more interesting than this talk. So, that, uh, uh, Matt, would you show that first clip, please? If I'm a teacher and I set out to teach the kids long division and they all learn long division, did I do a good job? Yes. Now, what if they when? didn't? Okay. What if they didn't learn long division? Did I do a bad job? Let's, say, let's say you teach three classes. And in one class they, they could do it, in one class they couldn't. Are you doing a good job or a bad job? Or How are about a good job in one class and a bad job in the other? But you did the same job in both classes. What's wrong? Somehow, teachers have to be held accountable. Not just teachers, but teachers have to be included in this for whether the students achieve. Now, you're asking, can you evaluate a teacher on the performance of the students? And yes. And yes you, or no? No, you cannot. You cannot evaluate a teacher on right. the performance of his or her students? Right. The, um, that's one of my favorite clips, uh, mostly for the math. 
don't know if you noticed, he said, suppose you have three classes and one of them learns and the other one doesn't. You know, <laughs> and, well, he, was, he was muzzled after he said that on national television. And that's an old clip. Uh, that's from, that's 10 years old. Because things really haven't ch have changed dramatically. And we are now um, moving faster than the speed of whatever to evaluate teachers based on test scores. Um, we, have, we have gone, when we were kids, um, women didn't have any, any real choices about occupations. And because of that unfairness, our schools were filled with incredibly bright women. And we trusted them. I, my mom, bless her heart, saved all my report cards and gave them to me. It was very depressing. But one of the things that struck me after I recovered from reading what the teacher said was how much space there was for the teacher to write something. You're nodding your head. If you're first grade, second grade, third, there was a big place like that. And then I had three kids of my own and you know, watched them go through school and that space got smaller and smaller. And finally, when the last one came on, there's no space for writing at all. It was just some check marks, you know. Um, so that's a consequence of the departure of all these talented women, a different teaching force, arguably not as talented, um, demonstrably not as talented. Um, and this rise of accountability. So we have gotten to this point where now teachers are being paid on the basis of test scores, fired on the basis of test scores, whereas it used to be, well, it's, it's how you present it. It's how well do you present the material, not whether they learn it. Well, they're, they're, they're both absurd. I mean, the swimming coach couldn't say, I taught him to swim, I'm sorry, seven of them drowned. Um, <laughs> But you, you can't, if, when you go to the extreme of evaluating a teacher simply based on the scores of the kids, you end up with a teacher saying, you have to do well or I'll lose my job, and kids being scared. Sleep. And you end up with a lot of cheating, by the way. And we have this huge, I mean, Atlanta is the poster child, but Washington, D.C., uh, Austin, Texas, I mean, you, any Pittsburgh, Baltimore, all kinds of places where teachers and principals have responded to this pressure for accountability by cheating. That polarization, we need to get to what in the wisdom of Ronald Reagan, trust but verify. And he was talking about the Soviet Union, and, but it applies in education. We need to have a system where we trust our teachers, but we also cut the cards. We also verify. And we, that's the balance we haven't found. But, and that's a polarization. Now, second, achievement. You know about the achievement gap? Well, the achievement gap is real. In some places, there is a gap of three years of achievement between white kids and Asian American kids. Think about it. Guess who's on top? I mean, the reason I make the point that way is to try to suggest the absurdity of this debate. I would, we're polarized about it, and we're polarized in my view because we focus on the outcomes instead of the process. There are, in, in American public education, in my view, there are four gaps, or if Jack Steinberg were talking, he would say there are four gaps. <laughs> uh, um, there's a gap in opportunity, which is very real, which is profoundly real. It's just in this state you can go from one district to another and see the difference. One, one school district will be using textbooks where we haven't landed on the moon. Others will have a climbing wall in the high school. Um, so there's an opportunity gap. There is, sad to say, an expectations gap. We don't necessarily expect as much from some kids as we expect from others. And kids live up or down to our expectations. I frankly think there's a leadership gap. Um, it's hard to lead in anything, I'm sure. My, my wife is a school leader and I see 
how she can see over the hill, but also work things through. And I'm in awe of that ability. But there are plenty of people with that ability. We need more of them in education. Put those three together, you end up with an outcomes gap, which we call the achievement gap. But if you only look at the achievement gap, what do you do? You drill the kids to get them to pass the test. You don't build the solid foundation. Unfortunately, kids are drillable. You can teach third graders and fourth graders to pass those tests. You can teach gerbils to run the wheel. That's not real learning. And all you need to do is look at the scores in eighth grade. Here's, here's third grade or fourth grade. Here's eighth grade. Here's twelfth grade. What's going on? If there's a real foundation here in third grade, you're going to go this way. So an achievement, a polarization about that. Um, there's, a, there's polarization on the issue of leadership in education. Should it be top-down, command and control, or should you try to find really capable people and let them run their own school, i.e. a charter school? Um, I want to, the, the epitome, the national symbol of top-down uh, is in this next clip. Uh, Matt, could you show this next clip, please? The re. In Washington, D.C., the new leader of the public schools is putting her house in order. The bottom line is I don't believe that you are going to be the leader who is going to take this school to, in the direction that we need it to go in um, and have the highest expectations for the kids. Michelle um, Ree so, spent the first uh, weeks of the school year you know, meeting one-on-one -on -one with all 156 principals down. under her charge. Um, so you... In any other sector, employees are expected to meet certain outcomes or deliverables, and everybody knows that if you don't meet those numbers, you go. That's what we're creating. No, I'm, I'm terminating your principalship now. Any compassion? Compassion? Um, I think that when you're doing the kind of work that I'm doing in public education, where the lives and futures of children hang in the balance, you cannot, you can't, you can't play with that. Michelle Rhee, uh, I think, fired 40 principals her first year and ended up replacing quite a few in the three years she was there. Um, but it's, a, it's that sort of top-down. This is what you have to do. You, you, I'll give you some tools to do it, but if you don't do it, you're out of here. Um, if you're wondering how our cameras got in there, how, how many of you have fired people? Yeah. How many of you would invite a TV camera in to watch you <laughs> fire somebody? It's, uh, it is, I mean, I'm a journalist. Somebody says, you want, we're going to fire some, I'm going to fire somebody you want to watch? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to say no. But, you know, that, so, but it's, a, it's an, a stunning moment. It became an iconic moment. Some people said, wow, that woman is really tough. She's really doesn't take any crap from anybody. And other people said, how'd that camera get there? <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, she's a polarizing figure herself. Um, but that's just the top down. Now, the, the contrast is in the city of New Orleans. As, as it happens, I spent three years f with Michelle for the news hour and did, I think, 12 pieces for the news hour about her, including that one. Um, and I also spent I've spent, I've been in New Orleans filming really since Katrina. We're editing that documentary right now. And the man they brought in, Paul Vallis, was brought in to get rid of command and control and to create a, an entire district of charter schools. Now, charter schools are public schools, but they're free from regulation for the most part. They essentially, in the charter, they promise they'll do this, this, and this. And then if they do it, they get their charter renewed. If they don't, they lose their charter. They, what they did in New Orleans, which they don't do in most places, is they set a very high bar for a charter. And they turned down like two-thirds of the men and women who wanted to run charter schools. They said, no, you're not good enough. Uh, and as a consequence, they have some, some quite good charter schools. They, but it's, there's this polar, there's this debate. What is the right way to have a vital public school system. You can't do both. You can't have command and control where if I'm the superintendent, I'm watching you and I'm watching you. 
if you have charter schools, you have to say, here's your charter, Bruce, we're gonna come take a look. We wanna know, you know what you, about your policies. There has to be some centralized authority, but essentially, we're saying, let's have good people and trust them to educate children. And it's intri an intriguing debate that, that um, is ongoing, and I hope you'll, we have a front line about Michelle Rhee, which should be on the air September 18th on PBS, and then this, the New Orleans documentary that we're working on uh, is not finished, but it's six years worth of video that we have to somehow bring down to 90 minutes. <laughs> so, um, talk about polarizing in the office then. Um, we're polarized, the, 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 the issue of the purposes of public education. I don't know if we're polarized. It may be that we're indifferent. It, it also could be that we're just, we're excluded from the conversation. I, I wanted to put it in here because I think it's important to talk about. I, I think it's less that we're polarized than we don't talk about it. But I want to. Because I think that the, the goal of school is to help grow American citizens. And each one of those words is important. Help. Schools are a junior partner. They are helping. It ain't their job to do it. It's their job to do it with the family, with the community. Grow. It's a process. It's two steps forward, sometimes two steps back. Learning, schooling is like a, a family business. It's not something, it's not one of those big corporations that's uh, on the stock exchange that lives and dies by quarterly reports. You have to recognize it as a family business and, and have a set of some tolerance for the fact that it's growing. Anybody who has more than one child knows that kids learn at different times and different rates. And we need a way to recognize that as part of the process. So help grow uh, American. We're not raising international citizens. That's not the primary purpose. Maybe, I, we hope they will be. I hope they'll be aware. But, but they need to be Americans. They need um, some understanding of the uniqueness of this country. They need to understand we haven't done everything right, but they need to be proud to be an American, in my view. And finally, citizens. We want, we want our children and your children and our grandchildren to, to grow up to be citizens. And with all that that means, that means that you know, they vote, they work, they're good parents, all those things. So it's not that, it's not that we're polarized, it's we don't talk about that. And maybe if we talked about that, we would be less polarized about the other stuff. I offer that as a suggestion. I, I think we are, we are polarized, and that the show of hands suggested that, about the power and the limits of school. Just what can school do? To what extent can school overcome um, Poverty, and I want to show you what is a, a chilling scene um, in many ways. This is in New Orleans, and one of the issues in the city of New Orleans is public schools had failed generations. They were the worst public school system in the country pre-Katrina. I mean, in some schools, only 4% of the 8th graders could read on grade level, 4%. So, there is not a tradition of going to school. A lot of kids, a lot, and would leave school, school, would not even go to school on Friday, because Friday was a half day, so they had, what the heck. And they'd go to get ready for the weekend, and they wouldn't come Monday, because they were worn out from the weekend. <laughs> well, you imagine being a teacher, and you've got the, this core of kids who actually come to school on Monday and Friday. Well, what do you do with the, 30% of the kids who didn't come, do you play catch up? I mean, it's terrifying for a teacher, not terrifying, just enervating, frustrating. But so the, the superintendent, Paul Vallis, even though he was setting up charter schools, was determined 
to get kids coming to school. And so this is a scene uh, with some truant officers. Would, Matt, Matt, would you play that clip, please? <laughs> to help minors who may not have the support they need at home, Vallis is getting tough with their parents. Police. Police. I'm uh, here to serve your summons. You got your ID? Are you going to go to court? Yeah, I have to take it, yeah. All right. Ma'am, make sure you go. Make sure you go because if you don't, we will come back out and pick you up and bring you down to lock up. That's your responsibility as a parent to make sure that your kids attend school. And this makes me very frustrated because this is a child education we're talking about. There's no excuse why a child should miss 21 days and it's just a second grader. Can I ask a question? Sure. Is there like any... Uh, any way that the state will pick them up. I mean, if, if they miss like a couple more days. You keep saying the state gonna take them, you sound like you don't want them. To be honest with you, I don't. If your parents don't want you, what, what kind of message do you think you send it to the child? I mean, it's frustrating, it's sad, it's very emotional, but at the same time, that's what we here for. I. I... Everyone who saw that on the news hour, or I'm sure, was as upset. 21 days of school. That we, we, school in New Orleans begins at the end of August. We filmed that early in October or mid-October. So we've had September and half of October and a week of August. So in seven weeks, the child had missed 21 days of school, and it was a second grader. Um, now you, you don't see behind the door. So you don't know if this is a teenage mom. You don't know if there's drugs or any of that. You know nothing, none of that stuff, and del deliberately. Um, but all you, it seems to me what you have to do is say, whoa, and we're expecting schools to fix that? Um, and many people do expect the school to fix that, but, and, and maybe forget that context. And a lot of you raised your hand when you said poverty and the attendant consequences. Um, and I think that's important to remember that schools, teachers are very often dealt a bad hand. Most of you, and I, I certainly would not be tough enough, strong enough, resilient enough uh, to do the work that many of our teachers do day after day. Um, teachers, by the way, are the other 1%, not the Wall Street 1%, but one out of every 100 Americans is a public school teacher. I don't know if you knew that. Actually, it's a greater, even more than that. You know, there are 3.2 million teachers and there are 300 million, whatever. But um, we, we ask an awful lot of them. But you, no, but you can't just throw up your hands and say, well, we can't do anything because there are plenty of examples of successful schools in those circumstances. There are plenty of them. You'll see some of them in our New Orleans film, and I've seen them in other places. Um, places where the kids learn, where there's joy. Uh, KIPP schools, everybody learns a musical instrument. Um, but so the polarization, you know, this, you, some people would, you know, throw up their hands and say, well, yeah, and it's other people's children anyway. On the other hand, so, so wait a minute, no, let's support the schools who are doing this. And then there are others who say, wait a minute, let's, let's address the issues of poverty. Let's address the issues of poor housing, poor nutrition. Um, we, we need to argue about that one. We need, to, we need to have discourse. I thought what Bruce said was significant. We need to have, uh, you know, I don't believe that the solution in these polarized situations, that the solution is right in the middle somewhere. I think we can come and reason together, but we may end up finding out as we reason together that you're right and I'm wrong. We may both move this way, but the notion that somehow truth is this elusive thing that is right in the middle somewhere between these folks and these folks I think is, is fallacious. Um, but what we need to figure out is a way to, in fact, listen to each other. Um, okay. The role of technology. I think we are polarized on that question. 
And I, that goes back in a, in a way to the command and control. Um, many adults use the technology to control kids, to keep the count, to keep the attendance, to keep their grades. And they do technology to children. There'll be a computer lab and there'll be a program learning and you'll sit down and you'll do these things. That's far more likely to happen in low income areas. In upper income areas, kids control the technology. Now, there, public schools, there, there are three reasons for school. There are really only three reasons. When you were young, when I was young, you had to go to school because that's where they kept, that's, sorry, that's where they kept the knowledge. Think about it. It was in the teacher's heads and it was in the textbooks. Is that true today? Absolutely not. 24-7. You, you went to school to be socialized. So the boys could get to talk to girls. So the Italian-American kid and the African-American kid or the WASP kid, they could, they could connect on some level. That was then. Today, there's an app for that, right? I mean, our kids are socializing. It's like pen pals on steroids. They are connected. Our 14-year-old is connected with other 14-year-olds around the world, texting, maybe even sexting. But, of course, that 14-year-old that she thinks she's connecting with may not be 14. It could be a you know, 40-year-old congressman. <laughs> Ooh. And has been, you know. That, uh, but but so schools have to have to embrace technology. They have to embrace it and use it. And the, the third reason you were sent to school was custodial care. Keep keep you safe while your parents worked. That still applies. Families, the adults are working. You have to have a place. But it's not a safe place if, they are, if the schools haven't changed in the first two ways. Our schools are answer factories. Fill in the bubble, get the right answer. They should be question factories. Kids live in this sea of stuff. It's not knowledge that's floating down, it's information. Often misinformation. So it's the job of schools and families and communities to help kids sift through this stuff and turn it into knowledge. They have to learn to ask questions. How do we know that's true? They have to, they have to separate the wheat from the chaff and we want them to choose the wheat, which means we're in the business of teaching values and we shouldn't run from that. Now, just a quick riff on technology. I, I believe to the depth of my soul that every elementary school should have an air quality monitor. It costs about 30 bucks. Go contribute one to your grandchildren's school. If the principal agrees that three times a day, the kids will go outside and measure the air quality, you know, nine, 12, three, and they will be linked up with every other elementary school in the state, or middle school, let's say, and they'll share the data, and they'll look for anomalies, and try to understand, they can, they'll be learning about the weather, they'll be learning all kinds of stuff, they'll have more and more questions. Why does this happen? Teacher may not know the answer, that's fine. Teachers should be on a journey themselves. But they will be creating knowledge. If you've got more than 30 bucks to give, buy them a water quality monitor for the high school, it costs about $170. Then the kids go to the water, and there are, I think, seven different measurements. Uh, alkalinity, acidity, you know, how opaque it is, and count the detritus, and share that data. The state of Texas has 4,000 miles of fast-running water. I think high school science classes should be going to the water and link up and share the data. 
and look for anomalies, find out what's going on. Um, I, I live in Manhattan. I look out my window, and I noticed one morning there's a garbage a trash can on every corner. And in one corner I had two. And my neighborhood is clean. I was filming at the time up in the South Bronx, and I, I'm not sure why I noticed it, but as we were walking to the, got off the subway, I was walking to the school, I noticed a busy street corner. There were f the four corners, one trash can. So I thought, you know, these aren't trash cans, these are cleanliness opportunities. <laughs> so I thought, what if all the seventh graders in Manhattan took a smartphone and mapped the neighborhood and then made a chart, figured it out? And then you go to Mayor Mike Bloomberg and you go to the Senate and say, why is it that there are more cleanliness opportunities in my neighborhood than in Carlos's neighborhood? Um, or maybe there aren't. Maybe you'd learn, in fact, there are plenty of them, and they're just, but then you can alert the community and say, look at the difference. You could go beyond that. You could ask the bodega guy to keep track of how often the garbage is picked up. And you could ask a doorman in my neighborhood. There's no bodega, but there's a doorman. Uh, how often are those emptied? And track that as well. But you then, and, and you're going to be writing. You're going to be doing numbers. You're going to be working with other people, which is an essential skill. And you're going to be, you'll be excited about going to school. And you're all you're using very simple technology to do it. You harness that technology that way, and then the kids are not, or will be less likely to use it for malicious ends. Because it is very easy to use it for malicious ends. We, we know about, enough about suicide, so. And finally, and I think the most significant polarization is, is what I call, you know, better people versus better job. There's an ongoing and pretty vigorous battle um, where there are two camps. They are absolutely unequally armed. Because in one camp is Michelle Rhee, um, Joel Klein, who used to be the chancellor of New York City, um, uh, Chris Christie in New Jersey, the Teach for America, uh, the Broad Foundation, the Gates Foundation. The, their, the fundamental point there is that teach, education will be better if we can only get better people. We need better people. We used to have blah, blah, blah. We need better people. There's a, the other point of view, supported by many teachers, um, the teachers' unions, and a woman named Diane Ravitch, who has a megaphone but not much else, um, the, arguing eloquently that we need to make teaching a better job. Teaching is a lousy job. You, you can't take a bathroom break should you need to. You are constantly interrupted by the principal when you're trying to connect with your kids. You are increasingly told that those test scores are going to determine whether you have a job or not. Um, you rarely get to talk to your colleagues. You almost never get to watch your colleagues work. I mean, there's a whole set of conditions. Um, and, and incidentally, you haven't been very well trained. Most teacher training institutions, you know, we probably should close half of them. And it probably wouldn't matter which half. Um, that, uh, but um, now, I, I used to think that that battle was over here, up here, and was irrelevant to kids who need a different, a new kind of school that I was just talking about. But I think, in fact, that polarization um, it hurts kids because while we're spending all this energy up here trying to have new ways to fire teachers or new ways to, you know, to to keep an eye on teachers, we are not we are not attending to the needs of our children. Um, I, I think we are in danger of becoming a nation of whiners. Um, I, I don't know if anyone reads my blog, but I write every week. Um, it, our website is learningmatters.tv. Uh, if you go to that, you, if you want, for some reason, want to know even more of what I think, you'll find it there. That, uh, but, in addition to being unwilling to communicate, 
with each other, as Bruce pointed out, especially in the Congress, which is the classic example. Um, you know, we're, we are unwilling to communicate, and so we complain. Um, you know, I think anyone who expects Washington to solve the problems of public education is, is uh, smoking something. Um, you know, we see how um, we elected a states' rights governor from Texas who proceeded to enact legislation, which is arguably the largest involvement of the federal government in public schools in our history. We elected uh, someone who said, no, that's the wrong idea. And that administ the current administration has imposed a new set of conditions. They're different conditions, but it's still Washington. Um, and I, I, you know, I think the evidence suggests that things are not getting better. Um, you know, it seems to me our schools and our political leaders ask, can kids read? Okay, that's an important question. But you have to ask the second question, do they read? Um, and I think the answer is no. Um, so are we, are we hopelessly polarized? Or maybe we're suffering from fatigue in education. I mean, this current education reform movement began back in 1983 with a report called A Nation at Risk that warned that our schools were drowning in a rising tide of mediocrity. 1983, a lot of good people have been working very hard to figure out ways to change that since then. I think perhaps in education, many, many people are simply tired. They're worn out from listening to the rants and the negativity of ineffective leaders. And I'm tired because they have been working hard to try to change the lives of children, sometimes with great success. But, you know, go back to Aristotle, who said, we are what we regularly do. We are what we regularly do. Now that's a nicer, a, a, a very elegant way of saying practice, practice, practice. You know, when you get to Carnegie Hall, you want to have a good jump shot, practice, practice. You want to play the violin well, practice, practice, practice. Yeah. So if we are what we regularly do, and all we do is complain, <laughs> nation of whiners. But it follows, and this is really the more important point, that our children become what they regularly do. So if our kids spend an inordinate amount of time practicing to take tests and then taking tests, and our children are the most tested children in the world, it's a huge enterprise, big money maker. But if our children spend an inordinate amount of time practicing to take tests and then taking the tests and then more tests, what will they be like as adults? Will they be readers? Will they be good writers? Will they be articulate speakers? Like, I don't think so. <laughs> so what is the solution? I should hit the glass here. <laughs> uh, strong leadership? Sure, but I don't think you can afford to wait around for strong leadership. I think we need to, one way to get beyond polarization is to figure out what we agree on and work on what we agree on. You know, do we agree that our children should learn to write well? Well, the only way to learn to write well is to write and rewrite under the direction of a skilled coach or teacher. Go to your schools and see if that's happening. It's not. Do we want our children to be able to be, to be articulate, to present? Then they have to practice, practice, practice. Is that happening in school? I don't think so. Um, and reading? I call your attention to a piece I did for the News Hour. That one I was went up in the South Bronx. Um, it, it's called Good School, Bad School. It's a school where all the first graders can read well. I, you, you'll see me. They'll see them reading a story I wrote on the board. 
and fourth grade they can't pass the reading test. It's astounding. I mean, I do I have time to tell this story quickly? Do I have? To, am I doing okay? Oh, they, um, my own strongly held belief is that most first graders can learn to read. If they aren't ready, they aren't ready, and that's okay. But most kids want to learn to read. They understand it's the currency. It's how you navigate this society. It's the same reason they want to learn to walk, to get somewhere. Now, if schools taught walking, we would have kids going like this. <laughs> but what the kid wants, the same thing with reading. They want to read so they can understand the world around them. So I, I, I this principle, we, we said, I said to my colleague, Kat McGrath, I said, let's get in the worst school we can and figure out what's going on. Well, there were some schools where three or four percent of the fourth graders, and they wouldn't let us in. But she, bless her heart, called a guy who's 12 percent, I think it's 12 percent of the fourth graders could read, pass the test, and pitched that we wanted to come. And he said, it's a good school, you can come. So on the phone, I didn't say, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, we went up there, and he said, it's a good school. And then I said, yeah, yeah, sure. He said, no, no, my first graders can read. And he showed me some first grade writing. And I said, well, will you let, give us full access to the school? He said, yes. I work for the News Hour, and people, you know, we're not Fox or MSNBC, and so people tend to trust us. So he gave us carte blanche. So we went into the first grade class, and the teacher was teaching kids that letters have sounds, and if you put two letters together, it makes a difference, you know, the right stuff. Um, and I said, may I take over the class? The teacher said, sure. So I said to the first graders, um, if I write a story on the board, will you read it to me? They said, sure, sure. I said, well, close your eyes. Now, if I say to you, close your eyes, you just close your eyes. But if you say to a first grader, close your eyes, they go. <laughs> <laughs> so it's wonderful television, you know. That, uh, and so while they were like this, I wrote on the board something there like, the pink pancake went swimming in the lake and ate a fish. Right? Okay, you laugh. Why? Because you understand it's stupid. So my, my, my hypothesis was that if they could simply decode it, they would do that. But if they snickered, they were comprehending. Right? Pretty good idea, if I say so myself. But, uh, <laughs> and so I said, read the story. And a couple of them read the story. And I said, anything wrong with that story? Well, now you've got to remember, these are little black kids. And here's an old white guy with white hair, and they're a little bit reluctant to say, your story sucks. But, uh, <laughs> but once they understood that was okay, it was Katie bar the door. You know what I mean? Was, and they were clearly getting it. But then in fourth grade, they can't pass tests. And I sampled that as well. Well, reading tests are designed to be so nobody has an advantage. They find passages about something nobody's ever heard about. So these inner city kids are asked to uh, read and answer questions about a paragraph of what the cicadas do to the farm. <laughs> now, you, you and we're grown-ups. We come across that passage. We just put it aside and turn the page and find a new article, <laughs> right? Well, we don't let our kids do that. So, but when when I did one-on-one -on -one with the kid, they were they were able to answer the question. But it's so stupid. And so, as one teacher says quite eloquently, we managed to take all the joy out of reading. It's this, you know, when I, if I were raising my hand for the big problem, I probably would do the testing one. I mean, I, because it's... Um, the kids have the power, they have the potential, it's there. So, if we want those things, if we want those things in our kids, if we can agree on one, then we have to. We can't wait around for strong leadership. You have to insist with your school board. You have to look to your school board. You have to look to your politics. And I think you have to look in the mirror. I think you have to look in the mirror. Now, for what it's worth, I very quickly, I would, I would do five things if I were in charge. I would have vibrant preschool. So kids get an early start at age, the way they do in France or Spain, Italy, um, those countries that are now beating us in college going. Um, I would have something called early college. 10% of our kids are now taking college classes in high school. 
I just did a piece for the News Hour about a district in South Texas on the Mexican border where 99% Hispanic, 89% poverty. I went to graduation at one high school. There were 80 graduates. 60 of them received their two-year college degree at the same time as they got their high school degree. We do not challenge our kids in high school. 10% of the kids work their butts off. 90% we don't ask much of them at all. So early college to make it seamless. And then I would adopt a program, a school, elementary school program by James Comer, which is a child-centered, child development, so that all the needs of kids are addressed and the teachers are trained in child development. And then I'd adopt a curriculum, a core curriculum developed by a man named E.D. Hirsch, Jr., called the Core Knowledge, which is half the curriculum. And it really, you learn what it is to be an American. You learn, and you, you, you learn to read, and they're joyful schools. Um, I said there were five. The fifth is I would, I would measure what counts. Right now, we count what we can measure. We can, and we, we count what we can measure. Think about that. We don't measure what counts. Now, you don't have to follow those recommendations, but we have to change course. You know, tinkering at the margins, worrying about test scores, which is what we are doing now, in an attempt to address our decline is not even slowing the decline. As Aristotle said, we are what we regularly do. Thank you very much. Thank you. I hope no one has a question about why this is on the program. That was truly a, a very exciting presentation. Uh, if I can have our two uh, fellows with microphones out there, please. Uh, incidentally, when I came home from dinner last night, I listened to an NPR radio program, which, uh, and it was their one hour TED section, and their uh, conclusion was that what's wrong with education are, the worst thing about education are rules and rewards, and that what education really should be about is teaching or getting kids to understand respect in themselves, in the in others, in teachers, and in the process of education. But, you know, there's lots that we could do. Fast. Okay, we're going to go to uh, Q&A. Uh, anybody who has a question, uh, file b behind uh, Townsend or, uh, or John and shoot. Uh, is this on? Uh, I'll, I'll try you. Okay. Sure. Let's maybe start over here. Is there, is there someone at this mic? I don't have my glasses. All right. We'll start right here. <laughs> uh, given that you mentioned a, a lot of innovative, exciting local things happening, in spite of the overall dismal picture that you paint, how does what is being learned in, with the good stuff get communicated to change the wider discussion and the wider if you will, political culture uh, as it pertains to education. How do I we communicate? Yeah. I, I love that question. Um, the best advertisement for our public schools are the kids. That's the first thing. The second thing you need to know, if you don't know, is that 80% of households do not have school-aged children, 80%. I'll, ven I'll wager that most of you do not have school-aged children at home. <laughs> but, um, now there's a connection with grandchildren, but 80% of households, so, so you need, you need to, to persuade that 80% that their investment in, in and support of education matters. Um, and the best way to do that is with your students. I would, um, again, technology, I would have a team of kids, and just make up a project, um, the Hanover Inn, I would have a team of um, um, 
students go do some interviews with folks about the history of the Hanover Inn. Get some, uh, or, oh no, let's not even do that. Let's do uh, military veterans. So go interview some military veterans uh, about what, what it was like to come home. You don't have to talk about what it was like over there, just what it was like to come home. Um, and, and put those stories together. And then you put them up on the web. And those people don't have kids in school, but they're saying, wow, I didn't know they did stuff like that in school. I would have, I would have um, uh, a team of kids go out, a team, always in a team, um, and ask the barber, uh, the woman who owns the deli, the dry cleaner, the manager of the Hanover Inn, Bruce, each to recite one line of a poem. You choose the poem. But then you string together his line, her line, and so on, as a reading of you know, where the sidewalk ends, or uh, you know, could be a soliloquy from Shakespeare, it doesn't matter, and then put those up on the web. Because people are going to go look at that. Hey, did you see, Bruce is going to be saying to his buddies, hey, did you, did you see that reading we did, that poetry? He doesn't have kids in school, but he's going to tell his other friends they're going to go look. And they're going to be saying, wow, I didn't know they did stuff like that in school. Now, those kids are learning valuable skills. They're learning t t the, this business where you have to set good sound. You have to do several takes. You have to relax Bruce before he reads. Let him read once and then say, that was terrific. Would you mind doing it again? Without insulting him, without telling him his first one was awful. Um, <laughs> And then you work together as a team to create that edit. You have a set of standards you have to meet, which is out in the real world. And the, the general public is learning. You can't have this isolated building. You can't say, leave your kids at the door, leave your money at the door. That's what I would do. There's a lot of good stuff happening in school. Yeah. On the other uh, side, Townsend. First, I'd like to preface my statement by saying that I am a retired high school teacher. Um, I. I appreciated very much your comment that we are taking for children the joy out of reading. Um, I'm seeing more and more as I talk to colleagues that are still working that we are taking more and more of the joy out of teaching. But, All the, but what is, I need your question. Uh, what do we do to attract the best and the brightest to teaching and not bury them in the paperwork? I know we need accountability, but... <laughs> I, I think you have to, I think you have to ask the right questions. If you ask educators, do kids have phys ed, you get one set of answers. But if you ask how many hours a day do kids get to do physical exercise, that's a different question. And the, the implicit in asking that question is that a bigger number is better than a smaller number. But you must ask those questions. How often do kids rewrite their papers? Rewrite, not just write. I mean, first drafts. Uh, don't cut it, but you have to ask the right set of questions and, and not accept, and, and you need to see for yourself, you know, trust but verify. But that's what I, you need to ask the right questions. We, you have to have them measuring what counts, not just counting what's easy to measure. Yeah, question? Yes, the um, a major growing resource we have in this country is people over the age 65. If one believes that small ratios of teachers to students is good for education. Are we doing enough to mine the resource of those over 65 to participate in the education and nurture of children? Uh, that's, that's easy. The answer is that's a crowd-pleasing question. The answer, <laughs> uh, the answer is, uh, I hope, equally crowd-pleasing. No, we need to do more, but I don't think yeah, but I think you, 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 you need to think how, carefully how you do that. I mean, um, just coming in and talking about your experience is, to the kids is not the way you do it. You do it, I think, where you have the kids say, we've got all these 65-year-olds. Let's, let's go interview them. Let's, let's, let's pull them in, but they become part of our product, not they come in and talk to us. I mean, I... I firmly believe that, I said schools are to help, they're to enable. I mean, it seems to me that if I were a superintendent, I would say to all my first grade teachers, you must every week have a homework assignment which involves the parent. This parent involvement committee stuff is a whole lot of crap. 
you do it organically. And so you, the first grade teacher says to the kids, okay kids, this week you want you to go home and ask your mom or your dad or your guardian to tell you about the first movie they remember seeing. And then you come tell the class. And you go from there. When the kids are writing, which they'll be doing at the end of first grade, you, have, you ask them to write not a paragraph about themselves, but at, write a paragraph about your dad or your grandpa's favorite food. So you've got to go talk to grandpa. And then grandpa's going to want to see what you wrote. He's probably going to want to see what the teacher wrote about what you wrote. And you're, so you're going to do this thing. You're going to sneak. And you can do it all the way up, certainly through elementary school, shopping, comparison shopping. But do it so that the parents are part of it. We have to. We have to have a way to acknowledge that you cannot get there without parents. And it's absurd to think that schools are in charge of, parents are the primary educators. At the same time, you have to elevate teaching. Every teacher should have a business card. I have a business card, you have a business card. But you go to the teacher and you say, hi, I'm John Merrow, and they say, yes, I'm Mrs. Maloney. Well, if the teacher had a business card, say, oh, hi, John, how are you? I'm Patsy. You, you connect on a whole different level, the, 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 and the connection is, that, that, that kid that you both care about. Yeah, yeah. Do, I'm not sure where I am. I'm over here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You've partially answered my question, which was what do I think we need more to involve the parents, not to involve the parents in the sense, but sell to the parents the benefits of not grades being the most important. Well, if, I've, if part I have of already education. answered it, I appreciate that, <laughs> and I will move to the next person. <laughs> yes. I noticed in the international uh, rankings that Finland was number one in most, if not all. What are they doing right? Uh, they, trust, they trust teachers. They pay teachers more. It's very difficult to become a teacher. They are heavily unionized, by the way. Um, if, if I could give you a bumper sticker for this, we need to make it harder to become a teacher, but easier to be a teacher. Okay. Oh, good. All right. Thank you. Harder to become, easier to be. Set a high bar to get into the profession. But then once you're there, you still have to verify, but you have to make it easier for people to be teachers. Yeah. Finland does a lot of things well. It's in, in, uh, but it, it's not necessarily they spend more money. They spend money well, but there's a lot of trust, partly because they have this high bar. Yeah. It's coincidentally, the other gentleman has partly asked. I'm sorry, same, I can't hear you. Uh, coincidentally, the, coincidentally, the other gentleman has partly asked the same question. Using your own criteria for... I, I am not hearing you. I'm sorry, we need to... Uh, okay. Uh, the other gentleman has partially answer, asked the same question, but well, using, then, excuse your, me, but <laughs> using your own criteria for what, uh, what works and what doesn't work, have you found it instructive to compare our private school systems with the public school system uh, to be more enlightened as to what would be good for the public school system and, uh, and analyze what works and doesn't work in the other countries compared to our own have you learned anything from those kinds of comparisons? Well, you asked, you asked two questions. Um, uh, the private school, I think, um, savvy educators, I, public educators I know say, well, gee, I think I'll try to do what they do at the private school. I'll try to, um, not everything that happens in private school is great. It can be just a nasty grind. Um, but uh, I, I went to a private school, and my wife is the head of an independent school, and I see that attention to detail, um, that creation of a, of a climate in the, in the school where most you get you want, what you want kids to say, we don't do that here. We don't do that here. You can, and there, there are things that I wish public school people would emulate. Um, and it's a, long, it's a long list, and it's another conversation. Maybe I'll get asked back, and we'll do it then. But yeah, yes, sir. You mentioned school boards, I believe, once in your hour and 15-minute talk. I, I'm sorry, I'm not. You mentioned school boards yes. once in your talk. <laughs> Is that right? The nations that are ahead of the US in most categories, like most nations of the world, have centralized school systems. 
Is American education at basis a victim of too much democracy and do we need to change our school board system? That is a wonderful question. And, and by the way, you say that when you don't know how to answer it. You say, I'm really glad you asked that. And you kind of back and fill while you're thinking, what the hell do I say to that? that there was an article in The Atlantic a couple of years ago uh, called First Thing We Do, Let's Kill All the School Boards. Um, we used to have 130,000 school boards. Um, now we have about 15,000. Um, we are moving probably inexorably toward a, uh, what is called the common core curriculum, a common core standards rather, which is setting standards of expectations and most states have now signed on. Um, we're, I think, um, I think school boards serve a valuable, fun can serve a valuable function. If they micromanage, they get in the way. They, they have become quite often just vested political interests because we, to try to take politics out of education, very often the school board election is separate from the general election. Well, the consequence is nobody votes, except the people who have their one issue. And so unions have run people to be on school boards. I mean, they, so uh, the, I, would, I would try to get politics back into education, but politics in the good sense of the word, where you have, you have conversations about, about what is in fact in the best interest of children. Um, I, don't, I don't think having, having, having seen Washington up close and personal, um, I mean, even with enlightened leadership like from uh, Dick Riley, who was Bill Clinton's Secretary of Education, it's a, tough, it's a tough sled to think that Washington can run public education. Uh, it's, it, I, would, I would like, education is a state function, and I think states have abrogated their responsibilities. Um, if states took a, a greater interest in the big picture, not like California where they have 400 different rules and laws, but in, in the big picture, then we'd probably be better off. But I, I, I firmly believe you have to have local, local control. Yeah. Do we have time for another? another? Two, more. Two more. Yes, sir. I taught third grade for 22 years. Um, and what I'd like you to, to comment on is how do we get public education away from the industrial model of everybody fits in the same box? Test, testing and core curriculum don't necessarily do that. That's exactly, that's a really good point. I wish, I wish you had written my speech because that should have been in there. The, um, the, technology, the technology allows kids to move through at their own pace. And we need to recognize that. I was in a, a charter school in Texas uh, earlier this year, um, and the, the ninth graders were using online and so on, they were zipping through, and they were doing 11th grade work. And the principal of the school had to say, okay, power down, guys, because the test only covers ninth grade. <laughs> now, what's the message to the kids? You know, sort of a why bother kind of thing. Well, the fact is, Schools are the last vestige of segregation. And I'm not talking race, I'm talking age. Again, if you have more than one child, you know they learn different spurts and so on and so forth. There's no, there's no pedagogical justification for separating five-year-olds from six-year-olds. And there's no pedagogical justification for seat time being the measure of whether you move through or not. We need, to, and the technology, as the gentleman said, the technology allows me to move a little more slowly, you to move faster. We need to, but it's inconvenient for the grown-ups. But we need to adapt to that. We, need, we want people to move through as fast as possible, mastering, growing, learning. You know, this is about expansion, exploration. Education, That's, those are those three E's. That's what we ought to be doing. It has to be individual. Does that begin with E? Yeah. Yes, well, I think this is the last question. Um, you criticize teacher education programs. Just how kind would, of an offside. How would you go about getting them to change? 
Well, there's some good examples. That's, uh, thank you. There's some good examples of good teacher education programs. Uh, Linda Darling Hammond at Stanford University has a program called STEP, which is a two-year program. And there's a mentoring there's a mentoring function. Other countries, teachers are hired and they spend the first year watching and learning um, because it's prestigious to be a teacher. We get people and we throw them in the classroom, sink or swim. Um, I, was a, I taught in high school for two years. I taught in a black college for two years. I taught in federal prison for two years. I, I can't remember any, in any of those levels getting much in the way of, of help. And I followed first year teachers for a long time and it was sink or swim back when I started as a reporter and it still is. We need, but they're good programs. They're a little more expensive, but you have to, as I said, you have to raise the bar to become a teacher, but then you have to nurture them. Um, you know, I say to my friends whose children are going in to teach for America, that the first thing that TFA person should do is latch on to a veteran teacher and say, when I screw up, will you help me? Because the, old, the veterans resent the Teach for America people because they think, you know, I'm here, everything's going to be fine. Um, there's a lot of wisdom in older teachers, but not just in that one. There's got to be a way to, to train new people to teach differently. So you can't just go copy what those teachers are doing because that, that won't cut it. So it's a, it's a real challenge, but there are some good examples at Arizona State, uh, Michigan State, uh, Stanford. There's some others. Harvard Graduate School of Education. Well, they don't train teachers. Anyway, that's, if we can talk more during the break. Thank you very much. You've been a great audience. Yeah.